Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Um, thank you for being here. Please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat. You can share your name, your pronouns, and your organization. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So really glad to see everyone here today. My name is Rebecca Goldberg, and I'm a co-facilitator of the Grant Makers for Education at a School Time Impact Group, uh, along with Kathleen Trapagan, who will be here shortly. Um, this morning's this morning's session is going to focus on uh, young people's mental health and well-being in out-of-school time programs. We brought up this topic because it's everywhere. I mean, every you know, everywhere you look, whether it's the newspaper, the local news, talking to your own kids, your friends and family's kids, it seems like everyone is talking about young people's mental health. Um, as you're probably aware, the Surgeon General's Office put out an advisory in December on youth mental health crisis. Um, and youth organizations are doing everything they can to respond and meet young people where they're at and prepare their staff to do what they need to support young people with the trauma that they're going through um, related to multiple pandemics and loss that they're experiencing, loss of experiences, loss of people in their lives. Um, and so we thought we would use this session to hear from two funders who are doing some specific funding around this issue um, and how they have shifted practices to really address this issue uh, during the pandemic. And then we're going to hear from two of their grantee partners who are working on the ground with youth organizations or are a youth organization to hear what it's like, you know, how are they supporting staff, how are they adjusting their practices. Um, and, and then we'll have time to, um, as per usual, have some breakout groups and hear from folks in this community to, to lift up what you're hearing and seeing and what might be working or what are challenges for you. And then I wanna just um, put a plug that next month, we're gonna go deeper on this topic and talk about uh, grieving and loss and that it, the impact on young people in particular. And we're gonna have folks from the New York Life Foundation um, bring in a couple of their partners and we'll have a representative from the Surgeon General's office join us as well who couldn't make it today. Um, so let me just share, you know, the advisory from the Surgeon General's office um, does have a number of action recommendations for youth organizations, for schools, for health organizations, tech companies, all different, you know, parents, caregivers. And so I think, you know, I think some of these are really useful, like um, how youth organizations, community organizations can help with the um, public education around the importance of mental health and reducing stigma, implementing evidence-based programs, um, ensuring programs are evaluated. And then some of the school recommendations were really relevant as well, like creating positive, safe, affirming environments, expanding social emotional learning programs, um, learning how to recognize the signs and changes of mental health and physical health challenges, um, supporting mental health amongst all the staff that you're working with and protecting and prioritizing students with higher needs or who are at higher risk. So I think those are really useful recommendations. Um, I'm going to put the advisory in the chat in case you um, want to check it out specifically. Um, and excited that we have some experts here with us who can talk about what that looks like um, in, in practice. So this morning we have a great panel. We're, we're joined by Sierra Fox Woods, who's a program officer at the Upswing Fund for Adolescent Mental Health. Uh, we have Dr. Ramona Cox, who's the director of the Champions Network at Doc Wayne, which is an organization in Boston, but she's coming from Detroit. And they're a partner with the Upswing Fund. Uh, we've got Terry Whitfield, Program Officer at the Skillman Foundation, who um, is also in Detroit and part of our steering committee for the OST Impact Group. And we have Christine Bell, who's Executive Director of Urban Neighborhood Initiatives in Detroit as well. So we've got kind of a nice little Detroit community with us this morning. Um, and uh, excited to have you all here. Thank you for making the time. So we're going to start with Sierra. Um, if you could share a little bit about the Upswing Fund and you know how and why this pooled fund came together. Thanks so much, Rebecca. And I'm here representing the West Coast. If we have any other folks that aren't based in Detroit, um, so the Upswing Fund was launched in October 2020 in response to serious concerns about the rising uh, negative impacts of COVID-19 on the mental health of adolescents, specifically adolescents of color and LGBTQ plus youth, who we know have higher uh, barriers to access when it comes to accessing mental health, mental health care. 
Um, our grant making approach is centered around providing core capacity or general operating support to community based organizations who are serving these populations well and meeting them where they are. Our focus is intentionally broad. Um, we include both mental health and well being in our focus because we recognize wellness happens on a continuum. And we recognize that preventative health care and even positive youth development play a key role in supporting whole person wellness um, and positive mental health. So in late 2020, we led a rapid response grant making process. We reviewed almost 500 applications and selected and awarded 88 grant recipients in our first round. Um, that was just over $10 million. And to date, we've awarded 92 organizations for a total of $11.7 million in funding. Uh, we are set up as a collaborative fund. So how that works is we pool uh, philanthropic investments from multiple donors to be able to subgrant out to our um, partners. Uh, we were seeded by Pivotal Ventures, which is the investment and incubation company of Melinda French Gates, and to date have uh, partnered with additional donors that help to support new rounds of funding, um, including a sneak peek. Uh, we are announcing a new round of grants next week. And just a note on some of our donors, a lot of them are focused on things like positive youth development that intersect with mental health. And they have seen partnering with us as the Upswing Fund is just a way to learn from a broader portfolio of organizations specifically focusing on adolescent mental health. Awesome, thank you. And I understand you have some reports that you've shared around what you've been learning. I'm curious, you know, you, you said you have a new grant, a uh, round of grantees coming out. Um, you know, what is it that you're learning from the work so far? Yeah, uh, thanks, Rebecca. I think, as I had mentioned, you know, going into year one, we knew that there were higher barriers um, to access for these populations, but everything that we've learned over the past year have just really affirmed that these issues will persist. Um, over the summer of last year, we led a series of in-depth interviews with our grantee partners to better understand, you know, what are the experiences that they're facing in providing culturally responsive care? Um, thanks for linking that. So in that first report, you'll see examples of culturally responsive care from our grantee partners. Um, and just last week, we released our second report that dives deeper into those interviews and what we learned about the four kind of common challenge areas that community-based organizations are facing when it comes to providing care. That's building community partnerships, funding, uh, measurement and evaluation, and workforce. We know that workforce continues to be um, a huge challenge in this area. So I won't, I won't talk in too much detail, but I just wanna highlight kind of three insights that have and, and continue to inform our giving. So one, our funding fills a critical gap in need for community-based organizations who don't have access to flexible funding. You know, we've seen over the past year really great increases in federal funding at like the SAMHSA level, but what we're learning is that those funds aren't trickling down to community-based organizations who are doing a good job at meeting youth where they are. They're going to larger health clinics and um, counties, but not necessarily these smaller grassroots community organizations. Uh, second, we know that access continues to be a challenge for both youth and their families. Like you said, Rebecca, many families over the past year have faced incredible loss of, of family members and of material resources, and that includes health insurance. So a lot of adolescents are struggling with, where can I turn if I'm not in person at school? Um, what are the resources available to me? And that's where community-based centers are really, um, really critical, and we're really proud to support those organizations to provide no-cost services there. And then last, um, like I had mentioned around workforce, we're just consistently hearing that there is a serious dearth in community uh, providers, culturally responsive providers who are able to provide um, clinical health care, but also, you know, program staff. What we're hearing is that with school districts and larger institutions who are now ramping up their mental health services, these community-based organizations are now competing for talent um, in, in places where they can't compete with starting salaries or bonuses that these larger institutions can offer. So 
um, we're seeing some nuanced uh, differences there in culturally responsive workforce dev. Thanks, Sarah. And I was blown away when we spoke earlier that I think you said as a result of the grants that you all had made, there was maybe 500 new uh, mental health professionals added into those grantee organizations, which is incredible. Yeah. And I imagine that wasn't easy to fill those roles too, those positions. Yeah, when, when I speak to some of those grantee partners who, who were successful in hiring, um, you know, some of them had to hire recruiters and, and work through really like creative ways to find to find new staff. And I think that that 509 number is really impressive because despite all of these challenges, they were able to find and hire. And a lot of them are, you know, building up capacity and new staff. Like they're looking at early career clinicians and that takes a lot of work. That takes a lot of guidance and um, support to train them. Yep, thank you. So I'm going to uh, shift over to Ramona. Um, so Ramona, if you could share a little bit about Doc Wayne and, and the work that you do, how you came into it. And, you know, one of the reasons I invited you in particular as one of the grantees of the Upswing Fund was I was intrigued by how you use sports to, um, as a vehicle for men embedding mental health services, but you really target non-clinical folks, how you train and support folks who don't come with a mental health background. And I think that's really relevant for the youth development field. So we'd love to hear a little bit more about Doc Wayne and the Champions Network. Sure, so uh, first, thank you for having me here and Doc Wayne. Um, so our mission is simply to, like you said, fuse sport and therapy to heal and strengthen youth. So we do that um, through utilizing the innovative practice of sport-based therapy. Um, to provide kids that may be facing behavioral or emotional challenges um, with, uh, we do group therapy. We also do individual therapy um, that focuses on social emotional um, learning and life skills. And some of those life skills include, you know, developing po positive relationships with their peers, uh, with their family members. We also um, help them with resilience and confidence. So we talk about all of those types of life skills. Um, through the Champions Network, which I am the director of, this is more external training. Um, and we do that with different organizations, schools, uh, clinicians, as you mentioned, coaches that don't have a clinical background. And we do that um, by sharing our sports-based therapy approach we talk extensively about trauma-informed care and mental health uh, support for kids. Um, the Champions Network allows us to make this work um, accessible nationally. So we do a lot of work nationally um, across the country, wanting to get into other markets. So, you know, with me being in Detroit, wanting to do some work here in Michigan, um, but we also do work globally. So we've done some work with the Far East Basketball Association. Uh, so we had an opportunity to train coaches in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, next month, we are doing some training with Israeli coaches. So we're wanting to be able to extend this to coaches um, everywhere. We wanna make it accessible to as many coaches as we can. Um, and we do this by doing it remotely and in person. And again, again we cannot do this work without our funders like the Upswing Fund. Um, so about me personally, I am not a clinician. Um, I have a background in sport-based youth development and my uh, degree is in sports psychology, uh, but I have done a lot of work with girls and helping girls face barriers that they have to sport and physical activity participation. Um, but I have uh, faced a lot of mental health issues, particularly depression, and I have, with my work, been very transparent with the girls that I have worked with. And in me being transparent, they have come to me to share some of their mental health issues. And I have felt that this is very important because, you know, we're in a crisis right now and they need the support. And this is, has brought me to Doc Wayne and determining that this is very important work that we're doing here. And I want to provide this opportunity for other coaches to um, be able to support the athletes that they work with. Sports, again, is a vehicle to connect kids, and, and that's why we find sports to be important. So, you know, engaging you through basketball, football, um, volleyball, but also other physical activities like 
um, you know, four square, capture the flag, those things as well will also make kids comfortable to be able to share with their clinicians or coaches um, some of the issues that they're going through. So again, sport is a vehicle to connect with kids. So what does that look like when you're training a coach who, you know, is a volunteer, I imagine most of the time and doesn't have necessarily a lot of background, maybe in youth development or certainly in mental health, like mm -hmm. how would you embed some practices that support positive mental health? Yes. So um, when we are doing our workshops, we make sure that they are easy to understand for any lay person that attends any of our workshops. And we make sure that we are doing baseline work with them. So we do a baseline understanding of trauma. So we talk about what is the definition of trauma initially. We talk about uh, what are some examples of trauma. Uh, kids come with uh, abuse. Uh, they may have experienced death, neglect, homelessness. And then we talk about what those expressions of trauma look like. So they may come to you um, very angry. They may come to you um, experience withdrawal. So, you know, understanding why is this kid not participating in the, in the activities that you're doing. So understanding what that even looks like before we really get into how to address these things is important. We talk about the key principles of trauma-informed care, what that even is, um, so they have an understanding of what, you know, trauma-informed care is. And then, so for example, validating emotions. When they come to you with emotions, how, what does it look like to validate those emotions? That would be an example of what it, a principle of trauma-informed care. And then the practical skills needed for um, implementing trauma-informed care practice. And one of those important things is self-care. So we're doing all of this with the kids that come to your space, um, you know, validating uh, emotions. They're coming with all of this trauma. How can you really deal with kids if you're not taking care of yourself? So those are some of the things that we talk about and these practical skills. In addition to that, we also offer trainings that are particularly for coaches that deal with athletes of color or kids of color and uh, athletes that identify as LGBTQ+. And we have to also add to that, when we're talking about athletes of color, um, we have to explore how racism impacts the mental health of those kids, right? So we include that. Um, and talking about LGBTQ plus kids, um, what techniques are needed to make sure that they have a safe space? So we also include that. So these are some of the things that we make sure that we include in our training um, to make sure that these coaches are able to support the youth that are coming to their space. Thank you, Ramona. I'm gonna shift over to Terry a little bit here. Um, Terry, could you share a bit about the Skillman Foundation and Wellness Works uh, and why the foundation has decided to invest in young people's well-being? Yep. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Um, afternoon, everybody. So uh, my name is Terry. I'm a program officer at the Skillman Foundation. I lead our out-of-school time strategy. Um, since 1960, the foundation has been really focused on improving outcomes um, for young people in the city of Detroit. Uh, we are a place-based philanthropy. We consider ourselves to be an embedded philanthropist uh, and, and working hand-in-hand -in -hand with our partners in that goal of improving outcomes, you know, really changing the game for young people in the city. So the Wellness Works campaign came about through a partnership with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, uh, where we agreed to each contribute uh, $3 million over two years uh, to programs, activities that support the well-being of Detroit youth and, and adults who serve them. And it is because of our uh, deep relationships with community and with our partners uh, that CZI reached out to us uh, to be able to support their uh, five city um, five organizations across the country uh, that were going to be uh, implementing these community-driven solutions, uh, namely to support social, emotional, and mental wellness in schools and, and youth center spaces. So we decided to really, because of what we've heard uh, from our partners, wanted to center these grants around three different initiatives. Uh, one was around many grants uh, to school leaders, youth providers, and youth-led projects um, that fund efforts to center personal and youth wellness. 
Um, we've also kicked off a, a principal wellness community um, in which school leaders can practice the, um, their own personal wellness in a supportive group and share what they've learned with others through a principal learning uh, community. And then we also continued our, our normal grant making, but extending it in spaces and places that really um, drill down on increasing uh, mental health supports to or, to uh, to our community. Um, one, um, um, for instance, is Caleb's kids. Um, they've been providing one-to-one -one, um, um, or small group uh, mental health supports and, um, and and resources to our nonprofit community, as well as uh, professional development opportunities to um, organizations within our portfolio and across the community. Thank you. And you had introduced us to Christine Bell from Urban Neighborhood Initiatives as a great example of a grantee partner doing this work on the ground. Um, Christine, would you mind introducing yourself and, and your organization and what your work with the Skillman Foundation has looked like? Sure. I'm Christine Bell. I'm the Executive Director at Urban Neighborhood Initiatives. Um, we are a place-based community development organization in Southwest Detroit, for anybody that is familiar with Detroit. Um, and so our organization works in three major areas, youth development, education, and land use and economic development. And um, and Southwest is a bit different than demographically than the rest of the city. So um, the majority of our population identifies as Latino um, and, and, but is also a very diverse um, area. We have, we have a, a, a native population, we have a growing Arab population, we have an African-American population and a white population predominantly from Appalachia. So um, it's, a, it's a really interesting neighborhood in terms of when you talk about mental health and um, culturally responsive mental health services. Um, and then I think the other piece that's important around that is about 60% of the population reports speaking a language other than English and, um, and, and it's predominantly Spanish. So I, I, like most of us, you know, COVID just really ripped open wounds. And, um, and so mental health um, and the current structure of the way that we provide mental health services um, is, is, is difficult sometimes for our families to access, whether it's they're not able to get to places or they don't have um, mental health providers that speak their language, that understand culturally where they're coming from. Um, it, it's, it, it has been uh, an issue. And so we were really grateful when the Skillman Foundation um, and others in Detroit really started to invest in mental health and invest in non-traditional mental health providers. Um, so we, uh, we had um, our, Tracy Gerardo is our mental health specialist and um, is, comes from an immigrant family. She's first generation. And um, so we have had a lot of conversations about how do we make sure that young people that need to see someone immediately are able to do that. And, and then also how do we make sure that our staff are prepared um, when young people are coming in to, to really support their mental health and wellness needs. Mm -hmm. And so um, with the Skillman Foundation grant, we have been able to train all of our staff in, um, in a trails curriculum, which is out of the University of Michigan. And it's a school-based mental health and wellness curriculum, but it, it is essentially um, uh, you know, teaching around social emotional. And so our staff is now trained in that, but we're also embedding that in all of our curriculum. Um, and so all of our frontline staff at this point have been trained in that. And just also um, important to mention is that all of our, uh, about 95% of our staff live in our neighborhood and about 98% have lived or live in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, so we, you know, this, when, you know, Sierra, when you were talking about, you know, um, staff that reflect the folks that are coming to see them, we have made a concerted effort to make sure that our staff are 
are um, both reflect our neighborhood, live in our neighborhood, and um, and for some, uh, this might be the path that they take. Uh, and and some of our staff that have been trained are under the age of eighteen. So mm -hmm. these are these are high schoolers that work in our after school programs, and so so they all have been trained. Um, we also um, we also were able to create the infrastructure. Um, and process to provide what our uh, what our staff are calling the, an intervention our intervention so short term counseling for folks for our young people that are experiencing sort of low to moderate anxiety uh, depression symptoms and then the third piece of what we're working on is formal a formal referral process to long term support to our partners but ensuring that those partners are rooted. Um, in in cultural competence, and and then our prevention piece is really a peer to peer model. So the other, um, what the Skillman Grant also afforded us was the ability to develop um, a, a mental health advocate model. So we have five mental health advocates that have all been trained. They're all young people um, under the age of 24. I think actually most of them are somewhere between 16 and 21. Um, so they're trained in, in mental health first aid and the trails curriculum. They have not, they are now leading um, in partnership with Heal by Choice, which is an organization um, that we've a uh, partner that we've been working with on monthly workshops that all of the young people that are part of our program, we serve about 600 young people in our programming from workforce development and youth leadership to traditional after school programs that they can attend these um, self-care and mental health workshops. Um, and then they're doing some, some peer to peer work as well. Um, and then we were also able to um, uh, give our staff a self-care retreat, mm. and which was really, really nice. And um, to take a moment and just like let our staff who literally, we closed down last March uh, or no, two Marches ago now, two years ago. And the next day our staff had put everything virtual. And I, I don't know how they did it, but our staff literally have not skipped a beat. And so it was really important for us to take a moment and say like, you also deserve, similar to what Ramona said, like you deserve time to reflect and, and really care for yourself. So, um, that's sort of what it's looked like on the ground. Uh, you know, now we're trying to figure out like, how do you su sustain this amazing work? Um, oh, the other thing that I will say is our mental health specialist who has an LLMSW, she has, she has also, this also afforded us to be able to train her in trauma, um, CBT and grief and loss training, which is some of what, you know, we're thinking, you know, we're seeing and, and is needed by our families. Um, and so she's been able to take those certifications, which we would have never been able to afford to do um, without this, this funding. So we're really grateful for the Skillman Foundation. Uh, um, I'm really grateful from how my, how our staff has, has, uh, has, has taken uh, the dollars and really done a ton. I, I, I was like reflecting with them and I was like, wow, this is a lot. <laughs> so um, uh, really grateful for that. But that's, that's what it's looked like on the ground, I think, is, you know, our, our kids really need places where they can connect and, and find services immediately um, when they need it. So that's yeah. amazing. I mean, I, yeah, the, the supports for the young people are amazing. I love the training of the young advocates and then the direct self care supports to you to the staff. I mean, I think this is like a dream checklist that every organization is looking for. Um, so I appreciate how you laid that out. Um, before we go to breakout groups, I'm curious if, if anyone on this panel has specific recommendations you wanna to give to this group. So knowing that we've got a combination of both funders and field leaders, um, you know, from your experience working with these two um, terrific funders, I mean, I think given that's grant makers for education, any advice that you would have to the funding community here of, of what is critical from your experience on working on these issues? Um, well, I would say uh, things are changing, but 
you know, initially when you hear words like uh, you know, uh, social emotional behavior health or mental health, they're, they're like, they can be scary words and funders want to kind of stay away from them. Um, but when you are wanting to develop the whole child, that includes mental health. And so I would say that this is definitely an area that needs to be funded. Um, I would listen to your grantees and, you know, talk to them about the needs of the kids that they're serving. Um, you know, we're definitely in a crisis. Uh, you add on a layer of COVID, you add on the layer of the social justice issues that we're having, and uh, there's definitely a need for these services and these resources. Um, so, you know, providing resources that grantees, you know, are looking for to address these issues. Um, so definitely we're grateful for the assistance that the Upswing Fund has provided. Uh, the Butler Foundation is another funder that has assisted us and they have reached out to their grantees to um, talk to them about their needs. They are providing summer camps. Uh, some of their grantees are providing summer camps and all of these camp counselors are again, not um, licensed clinicians, uh, they're just coaches. And so we'll be providing trainings for them as well so that they can address some of these issues that kids are going to be coming to their spaces with. So um, just making sure that this is a priority in developing the whole child. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. If folks are interested in learning more about your training, Ramona, should they, can they reach out to you? Do you wanna? Yes, so you can definitely reach out uh, to the website, www.docwayne.org org, or you can reach out to me. My email address is rcox, so r-c-o-x, at dot wayne, docwayne.org. So d-o-c-w-a-y-n-e dot org. Great. Thank you for that. I'll put it, I'll throw it in the chat. I threw it in the wrong place. Um, Thank you great. so much. Any other um, suggestions from this group before we move into breakouts? And I just, I just want to add to what R Ramona said. I think yes, and that this isn't, um, this is a marathon. So if we were to, if you were to have asked us pre-COVID if we needed this, we would have said yes. Mm -hmm. We would have, we would have laid out a similar sort of need. And I know that fun, and and I think what has been really um, amazing for us as as a non-traditional mental health provider we have a, a very structured system and you know you call the line and they assign you a person and a place but maybe that place is not near you um, that you know we've been able to innovate and we want to be able to keep doing that and at philanthropic dollars allow for innovation you know, once you start to get into, and we're having this conversation because I'm pushing around sustainability. And so we're talking about Medicaid and we've had two consultants tell us like, I'm not sure you want to go down that route. You might not be able to do the things you're doing right now. Hmm. And so, so I think, I think that it's important to have philanthropic dollars, but also, I know that philanthropy, you know, sort can move on quickly. And I just think with kids, you can't move on. Um, you know, there's there's got to be, and this is something I've appreciated about our partnership with the Skillman Foundation, as well as, you know, some of their, you know, how they frame their initiatives and things like that shift. They're, they've been such strong partners and um, in, in helping to, to serve young people through their their the, their youth continuum, like their lifespan, that are actually our mental health specialist was a was a young person in our program. So, uh, and and actually the consultant that we just hired to help us with this 
I did not know this when I did the interview with him, but he also was part of our apprenticeship program, which is one of our youth, one of our workforce development programs. Yes, Terry, I did not tell you this. <laughs> was, and, and my staff did not tell me when I interviewed him. And he was like, yeah, I was part of, um, I was, I was part of your workforce development program. You placed me in a clinic. And that was really the start of me wanting to be a clinician. Wow. And he's a full-time clinician at the Ruth Ellis Center, if anyone's familiar. And, um, and now he's gonna, uh, he's consulting with us to help us continue to build out this work. And he's, he lives like down the street from our center. And anyway, so I, I, those are two examples of the power of, of, continuous mm -hmm. um, investment in in kids and organizations that serve those kids. That's great. Thank you, Christine, for sharing that. You're welcome. Okay, I, we're going to have a chance for you all to talk to each other. So we're going to go into breakout groups for about 15, 20 minutes. And I'm going to put a couple of prompts in the chat as well as a note catcher. So if you wouldn't mind when you get in your groups, um, each of the panelists will be in a group. And uh, if someone could just take some light notes to capture some of the conversation, that would be awesome. Um, and then we'll come back to the main room to close out and hear what's next for the group. Um, so Jesse, if you could uh, put us into breakouts, that'd be great. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, wonderful to see you back in the main room. I hope you had productive conversations in your breakouts and with the panelists. I wanna thank all of our panels who join us today, uh, Sierra, Ramona, Christine, and Terry. Um, I think it was motivating and I heard in my group, certainly a lot of validation of the strategies, interesting um, local you know, approaches that are happening. Um, we ha I heard some ideas around pushing traditional education funders to support in this space. Um, if you're any like great messages or um, you know aha moments, if you wanna throw them in the chat from your breakout groups, I'd welcome you to do that. Um, and so before we wrap, I wanted to share that, um, you know, I mentioned this at the beginning, but next month on this uh, stakeholder call, we're going to go a little bit deeper onto these wellness issues, but really thinking about grieving and loss that young people are experiencing and the supports that are needed um, to address the, the different aspects of grieving and loss. So look out for more information on that. If you've if you're here, you are registered for that session. So um, make sure to mark it on your calendar for the third Friday of the month at 12 Eastern time. Um, and in addition, I wanted to just give a, um, a shout out to the Power of Us Workforce Survey. So we brought this up in the fall during our series on the workforce uh, challenges. And um, American Institutes for Research is launching their uh, comprehensive youth fields workforce survey. It is called Power of Us. I've put a, a link in the chat to register for the launch webinar, which is on Tuesday next week, February 22nd at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, that's to get excitement and to learn what is the survey. But as soon as that uh, webinar um, finishes, the survey will be live. So if you register for that webinar, you'll also receive all the updates um, by email moving forward. So even if you don't attend, it's good to sign up so you get on the email list. And that um, we're looking for everyone here and all your colleagues to help promote it, get everyone who works with young people to complete the survey because we'll get really valuable data on who these folks are working in all different environments. What are the supports they need? What would keep them in the field? Why are they staying in the field? What are their career aspirations? And um, we'll be bring more about that to this group later as the study continues. Um, and then I also wanted to give a heads up that the for the funders on the call, Grantmakers for Education is releasing its RFP for the conference on February 28th. So um, I'll put the link um, in the chat to just keep your eye out for that and come back at the end of the month. Um, we always like to make sure there's a well-rounded program, including uh, sessions that relate to the youth development community. And so we encourage folks to submit, reach out to Kathleen and myself if you want some support and thinking about ideas. Um, and that conference will be in October in Austin, Texas, all fingers crossed in person. Um, otherwise, I think, I think we're closing out for the day. So um, wish you a wonderful weekend. Thank you for joining in the conversation and look forward to seeing you next month.